Hey, so if you're new this morning, my name is Adam. I'm Am, the pastor here. What a privilege it is to have you with us this morning and worshiping uh, with us. Man, our one desire, our one passion is just his presence because we believe his presence transforms our lives. Amen. That's what he does. We are in a series right now. We've been calling Jesus Stories, and we're looking at the different miracles uh, that are found in the New Testament that Jesus did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This morning, we find ourselves in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. So you want to get your Bibles out, go ahead and turn there. We're going to read here in a moment. We'll be in verses 21 through 28. This is the second part of this message. Last week was part one. So I encourage you, if you missed last week, go back and check that out. Look at it. I believe it's a pivotal message for us as our church. And this is part two today. So part one was verses 14 through 20. We'll be in verses 21 through 28. Before we read verses 21 through 28, let me give you a recap of where we were at uh, last week, what we talked about last week. So Jesus sets a demon-possessed man free. And then his, uh, the religious followers of that day came against Jesus and said, hey, you casted out this demon by the power of Satan. And Jesus is like, that makes no sense at all because a house divided against itself cannot stand. Why would I do that? So he uh, goes against his naysayers with just simple logic. Like, I would, I'm not operating in that spirit. And then he says at the very end this very powerful phrase, which we spoke a lot about on last week, we kind of concentrated on, and he says this. He says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so we broke this down, this phrase down. If I cast out demons... By the spirit of holiness, which wrote the law on Mount Sinai, then surely the kingdom of God has captured your heart. I've been praying all week for you this week that you would be captured by the heart of God, captured by the Holy Spirit, and that the spirit of holiness would write the law on your heart. That, we wouldn't, that we're what? We're not bound by the law. The law is not ruling over us, but what it is is Jesus wants to write it on our hearts. And so Jesus says, may you be holy as I am holy. And that is an impossible thing to do outside of the Holy Spirit. Because none of us in this room are righteous. None of us are worthy. But the Lord wants to write his law on your hearts. How many of you just invite the Holy Spirit to write the law on your hearts? Come on. Invite the Holy Spirit to come in and to make a difference in your life so you can be holy as he is holy. So let's pick it up in verse 21. It says this. When a strong man... Fully armed, guards his own palace. His goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places. Seeking rest and finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the man is worse than the first. Verse 27. And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. Here's Jesus talking now, but he said, More than that, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and what? May we keep it. May we hear the word of God and keep it. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you were here in this place. Lord, I ask that today, God, that you would work and move in our lives, Jesus. That, Lord, you would make your word alive in us. 
Lord, I pray that for any desire that's inside of me, God, to please man, God, I pray you would rid myself of that, that, Lord, your words, God, would flow through me, Jesus. I pray for clarity in every mind and heart this morning, that, God, we receive from you exactly, God, what you have for us. Jesus, my prayer today is that you would teach us your ways, for, Lord, we want to know you and find favor in you. So, Lord, we humbly submit ourselves before you today. We love you, we bless you, and we thank you. And everyone said amen, amen, amen. How many of you enjoy spreadsheets and statistics? Anyone in this room? I just lost a bunch of you. <laughs> some of you in this room are like, yes, spreadsheets, statistics. I'm not one of those, but I want to give you some stats this morning to start off with. Practicing Christians has nearly dropped in half since the year 2000. From 45% to just 25%. The growth of atheists and agnostics has nearly doubled in size from 11% to 21%. In the U.S., ages 18 to 29, those who grew up in church... 64% of them, nearly two-thirds of them, have withdrawn from church involvement as an adult after having been active as a child or teen. These are staggering statistics. One thing that we're doing is there's going to be a college ministry that's going to be starting up ages 19 to 24 here in the next month, so we'll be looking out for that. Only 28% of churchgoers are involved in a discipleship community down from just 12% three years ago. 46% of pastors under the age of 45 say they are considering quitting full-time ministry. Church, if this doesn't tell you that we are in a battle, I don't know what else will. Listen, we are in a battle. It is a battle between light and darkness. And we can't just be sitting on the sidelines looking on. We've got to be active and into the game as warriors of the kingdom of God. Because this battle is against the light in the kingdom of God versus the darkness in the kingdom of Satan. Ephesians 6 says this, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Listen to me, church. Our battle is not against someone else. Our battle is not against people. Our battle is not getting against someone who has offended you even. Our battle is not against that family member who might have mistreated you. Our battle is not against the boss who doesn't hear you out. Our battle is not against y'all Joe Biden or Donald Trump. It's not a politician. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. But our battle is against the unseen world of the kingdom of darkness that is trying to hold back the kingdom of God. That's where our battle is at. The good news is this, though, that Christ, he's given us every single tool for this battle. In Ephesians 13 through 18, it lists out the armor of God. And these tools, this armor in which we are called to put on daily is our weapon against the kingdom of darkness. It's the breastplate of righteousness. And I find it interesting that the breastplate of righteousness, it covers our heart. That there's no one in this room who can be righteous. This is only by Christ. And we are covered only through the grace of God and salvation. He's called us daily to put on the belt of truth. How many of you know that we need to be able to discern right from wrong in the day in which we live? 
We need to be able to see truth. We got to put on the belt of truth. He's given us the feet of peace. The feet of peace. Many of us in this room are struggling with anxiety and worry, and we lack peace that only comes from what? God. True peace only comes from God, not when everything is perfect and everything works out. The shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. If we're not reading the Word of God, my friend, we've got no offensive weapon. You see, when the enemy comes and attacks against you, you've got to write the word inside of your heart. How did Jesus defeat the enemy while he was in the desert? He spoke the word of God. You've got to have the sword of the spirit and the helmet of salvation, which renews your mind every single day. Listen, we can have victory in Jesus through the tools in which he gave us. We are in a battle. We are in a war against the kingdom of darkness. And when I'm reading this in Luke chapter 11, it is such an incredible picture of this battle. Look at this, verse 21. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace. Now remember that phrase, guards his own palace. We'll get back to that here in a moment. His goods are in peace, but when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. Again, here Jesus paints this incredible picture of this battle that's going on. This strong man who has taken ownership, but then a person who is stronger, which is Jesus. The strong man is Satan, but then Jesus painted a picture. He's saying, I'm the stronger man, and so when I come in, I can have victory because there's no... We give the devil, we give Satan way too much credit, y'all. Way too much credit. Jesus is all-powerful. He can overcome Satan at just a snap of his fingers. It's so easy for him. And I look at this, and I look at Jesus' ministry in the New Testament here, and I think about it. As we're going through these 37 different miracles, and we've covered many of these now at this point, seven of them is Jesus casting out a demon and bringing deliverance in somebody's life. So this is an important ministry for Jesus, and I believe it's an important ministry for the greater C Church, amen? Amen. But with this comes some questions. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to give you four questions and answer them as we are talking about this battle that is happening and going on in our world. So the first question is this that arises when we're talking about this subject. Can Christians be bound by a demon? Can Christians be bound by a demon? Listen to this. Most believers are not free because they don't believe they can live in bondage. Most believers are not free because they don't believe they can live in bondage. John 8.36 says this, and this is an incredibly well-known passage that we love to quote, and I love it. It's good. For whom the Son sets free is what? Free indeed. But who is that talking about? Verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him. Jesus is talking to believers when he makes this statement. And if he's talking to believers, it means that believers can live in bondage, y'all. Let me tell you about an experience in my own life with this. Back about four years ago or so, I have a, a building that's separated from my house. It was an, a wood workshop when I moved in and I turned it into a, a studio, a recording studio. And so I would try to rent out the space to pay for some of the equipment that I had purchased and bought. And so I would have engineers come in, sound engineers come in and record people, and then they would pay me for the time that they had run out the space. So I had someone come in and record, and for whatever reason in my heart, I knew they needed to go check to see what was 
recorded. And so that night after the recording session was done, I went back and kind of looked at what was being recorded that night. And as I began to listen to the music that was recorded, it was the most vulgar stuff. Every cuss word, every vulgar slang, everything, it was demonic. And that night, I felt, I'm, I'm serious, like I felt this push in my back. It's like somebody was poking me. It was about 2 a.m. in the morning, and I woke up, and I heard the phrase, do not defile my altar. Do not defile my altar. You see that where I was, where was being recorded is the place that I spend time with the Lord, my secret place. And the Lord was saying to me, why are you doing this, trying to make money off of something that I gave you that is only for me and you? Don't defile my altar. So I said, okay, God, I get it. I'm not going to allow that to happen anymore. But shortly after that, for the next two, three months, I went into this time and this, this place where I'd have, honestly, these thoughts of suicide. I felt depression and anxiety. Mind you, I'm, a, I'm on fire for God. I'm a worship pastor here at Journey. But every once in a while, I'd have this feeling of depression, anxiety, and thoughts of suicide from time to time. And I didn't really know what was going on in my own life. I didn't know what I was experiencing. I just was like, this is not me. What is happening, Lord? I don't want to think this way anymore. I had a call from a, from a friend of mine. And they said to me, Adam, I feel like there's a demonic spirit trying to come against you, trying to take your life. And as soon as they said that to me, all of a sudden, I remember what was recorded in the studio. And I knew that what was being said was true, that I had opened a door in that moment that I didn't even know was being opened that was allowing this spirit to come against me, and it was causing anxiety, depression, and thoughts of suicide in my life. So when you hear something like that, what do you do? I immediately started going around my house. I grabbed the oil in my kitchen. I went around to every single doorpost in my house. I anointed every single doorpost. I said, God, Lord, would you put a hedge of protection around me? Every demonic spirit has to go in the name of Jesus. I went outside around my, my property, and I just said, Lord, uh, would you guard this property? No, no spirit but the Holy Spirit in this place over, over, this, over my house, over my kids, over my family in the name of Jesus. And I began to to pray and go to spiritual warfare for the next 30, 45 minutes. So I was in spiritual warfare. I got, I went to the back of my house and, and there's string lights that were on. And I'm just praying and saying, and I, I said this phrase, I said, every demonic spirit, spirit of suicide, you have to leave in the name of Jesus. And I promise you, I'm not making this up. You can trust me. As soon as I said that, the lights, the string lights, like they're here, like in here, immediately turned off. I looked inside and all the lights were on inside. And then the string lights turned back on. And all of a sudden I just felt my spirit, God saying, I'm giving you a sign, you're free. Now do not go back to what, you, what, what was allowed in your house ever again. And I was free in that moment. I was being to worship God and praise God because I found freedom. I was like, Lord, I'm not going back to that. I'm not opening that door ever again in my life or allowing that door unknowingly to be open. You see, Christians can live in bondage. We can be people who live in bondage when we open a door in our life. C.S. Lewis, he says this, there are two groups of people that Satan gets excited over, the skeptic and the superstitious. The skeptic and the superstitious. You see, there are people who believe that there's a demon behind every bush, that if something goes wrong, it's a demon's fault. Then there are people who say, man, demons don't exist, it's non-existent, we're, we're good. Both are wrong attitudes to have. And we need such a sense of spiritual discernment to determine what is happening in the times in which we live. 
Jesus came to set us free. You'll never be free unless you understand that even believers can live in bondage. So I want to clear up one other thing this morning. So question number two is this. Can a Christian be demon-possessed? Can a Christian be demon-possessed? Let's go back to the original language to answer this question, okay? So two Greek words for this to make up demon-possessed. It's demoni zomai. Demoni zomai. Demon I mean demon, zomai mean possess. To translate these words, it's okay to say demon possessed, but the really, honestly, y'all, the better terminology is demonized. So listen to this, because there's two Greek words for it. One is ownership. The second one is to gain mastery over or to gain control over, to have power over. So to answer this question, can a Christian be owned by a demon? Absolutely not. We cannot be owned by a demon. Why? Because we are owned by God. If we've given our life to Jesus, we cannot be owned by a demon. Because the Holy Spirit is inside of us. But can a Christian be under control of a demon? Can we have a stronghold in our life? Let me read this. This is Thayer's definition. When talking about demonizomai, to be under the power, under the mastery, under the control of a demon in a certain area of your life. Maybe it's because of lust, unforgiveness, bitterness, gluttony, I don't know, you name it. Here's another definition from a commentary. One cannot speak of a person being possessed by a demon, more appropriate expression may be the person possesses or has a demon. In other instances, an idiomatic phrase is employed. The demon rides the person or the demon commands the person. So let me ask you this question. Is there an area of your life that you just can't get victory in? Is there an area of your life that it feels like you've tried time and time again to turn from? And you said, okay, I've been dealing with this for 20 years now. It's just a weakness in my life. Let me tell you something lovingly. Wake up. Wake up. You're in bondage. Wake up. You're in bondage. But this is not bad news, church. This isn't, what I'm telling you right now is not bad news. This is good news because now you can recognize and you can know it. And I know the one who can set you free in one instant. I know the one who has all the power over the, uh, the, the darkness of this age, the darkness of the world, and that is Jesus. And because the price on Calvary, you can have freedom. We can be in bondage, but it's so easy. You see, in the presence of God, everything is easy. And he can set you free in just one single moment. God wants to bring freedom today, just as he brought freedom to that mute man in Luke chapter 11. The third question that comes up, once I'm free, can I experience bondage again? Once I'm free, can I experience bondage again? Look at this, Luke 11, 24 through 26. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last day of the man is worse than the first. This is a bit of a a scary passage that they'll return seven times worse. But... Let me give you a little bit of ease of mind this morning. This is talking about a non-believer here. Okay? This is talking about a non-believer, so you can breathe a little bit. (laughs) So not a believer, I don't believe it's going to come back seven times worse. How can we say that? How do we know it's a non-believer? Because verse 21, when a strong man fully armed guards his what? His own palace. So this is talking about a non-believer. What about believers, though? Can we still go back and get back into bondage? It's not going to be seven times worse, I don't believe. 
If we open that same door again that caused us to be in bondage in the first place, it's going to be equally as bad, if not worse, but it may not be seven times worse. Okay? So you can breathe easy. This, this, is a, this is the last question I want to answer this morning. How do I stay free indeed? How do I stay free indeed? Verse 27, and it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from a crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. But he, this is Jesus talking, and he said more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So we obey him and he says, blessed are those who who hear the word of God and keep it. It goes back to verse 20 from last week. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Listen, in our lives, we can open doors, open doors that allow the enemy to come in. And the enemy has one desire, and that is to steal, kill, and destroy. And if we open doors through pornography, bad music, sex before marriage, horror films, alcohol abuse, we are opening a door to allow the enemy to come in. And here's the thing about it. The enemy will do just enough to keep you in bondage to not allow you to know that he's actually there. Because what he wants to do is he wants to come underneath the surface. He doesn't want you to know that you're bound and he's tormenting you. He'll do just enough to keep you down and keep you back from your calling and what he's called you into. You know, I believe every single person in this room, you have a calling and a destiny in your life. You have a purpose for the kingdom of God. And when you open a door, the, the, the Satan is going to try to do everything to bind you up, to keep you back from knowing that he's there. Why? In Proverbs it says this, verse 31, 631, but if he, this is referring to a thief, I said earlier the thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. So if he is caught, he will pay what? Sevenfold. Listen, when we realize that the enemy is there and we get freedom and we allow the Holy Spirit to come, on, come in and to write the word, write the law on our hearts, the enemy has to pay back sevenfold what he's stolen. So do you think that he wants to be caught? No, he doesn't want to be caught. He wants to do just enough to keep you in bondage. But I'm here to tell you this morning, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. That we, can, we, we might be bound, we might live in bondage, but man, Jesus is stronger than anything. It said the strong man, Satan, when the stronger man, Jesus, comes against him, he's going to set them free. He's here to set you free today. So a lot of people will say this. Do we need discipleship or deliverance? Do we need discipleship or deliverance? Some will say, oh, you just need, a, you need discipleship. You need someone around you to pour into you, and that's all you need. You don't need deliverance. Others will say, you only need deliverance. You only need to be uh, free and you need to get prayer and, and get out of bondage. So the question is, do we need discipleship or deliverance? The answer is yes. We need both. Why? Because you can't cast out the flesh and you can't disciple a demon. You can't cast out the flesh, but you can't disciple a demon. So whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So this is my point this morning, and this is what I want to get at. This is where it comes back to last week. This is why this is part two, because it kind of comes together. What we want to do is we want to turn from the bondage and allow the Holy Spirit to set us free. And what does the Holy Spirit come and do? He comes and he writes the law on our hearts so we don't turn back to that old sin. We don't open those doors anymore. And so what happens, he writes the law on our hearts, giving us this desire to follow him and to be holy as he is holy. You see how it all fits together? So what the Lord wants to do is he wants to bring freedom into your life and allow the Holy Spirit to fill that void and fill that place. And for you never to go back to live in bondage ever again. 
So, Lord, I pray in this room today, Father, that, Lord, you would set your people free. God, is not anything that I could say, not anything I could do. It's only by the power and the Spirit of God. And so, Holy Spirit, would you set us free today? Any area, God. Any area, Jesus. Would you search our hearts? Would you rise and stand with me?